You know the difference between a pessimist and an optimist? The pessimist, the glass is half empty. The optimist, the glass is half full. The engineer, the glass is twice the size it needs to be. And the visionary, okay, we need to figure out how to fill this bigger glass. <laughs> Indeed. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Behind the Tech. I'm your host, Kevin Scott, Chief Technology Officer for Microsoft. In this podcast, we're going to get behind the tech. We'll talk with some of the people who've made our modern tech world possible and understand what motivated them to create what they did. So join me to maybe learn a little bit about the history of computing and get a few behind the scenes insights into what's happening today. Stick around. Hello, and welcome to Behind the Tech. I'm Christina Warren, Senior Cloud Advocate at Microsoft. And I'm Kevin Scott. And today, our guest is Charlie Strauss. And uh, Charlie is a science fiction writer and a Hugo Award winner. His novels include The Laundry Files series and Merchant Princes. His work has been translated into 12 languages for readers around the world. I'm curious, Kevin, when did you encounter Charlie's books? Uh, It's been a while now. I think i first discovered him with his uh, first big commercial work, or at least the first one that was published in the United States. So it was a book called Singularity Sky, and it was, uh, you know, sort of funny enough about the singularity. So that moment when artificial intelligence becomes self-aware and is in control of its own development and all of a sudden evolves beyond human understanding. Uh, and then, the the rest of the storytelling in the book was what happens after that. Uh, and it was just so interesting. I read a bunch of the singularity books that s- other science fiction authors had written. And like the interesting thing about Charlie is like it, he, he writes these books that have just deep technical, like some of these uh, like really great hard sci-fi characteristics that I really love. Uh, but his characters are great. And he... He has humor in them, um, you know, and and you you can tell from reading his books, he has such a broad range of interests and like reads uh, so many things and like draws elements from, you know, everything from theology to, uh, you know, his his background in the early computer industry into the fiction that he writes, which just I really, really love his books. (laughs) I love that. I love people who have such a broad background and broad interest. I frankly think they're the best storytellers. So let's hear what Charlie's been up to. Our guest today is one of my favorite science fiction writers, Charlie Strauss. Charlie's work spans genres, mixing spy thrillers, science fiction, and Lovecraftian horror. He's the author of six Hugo-nominated novels and winner of three for Best Novella. I'm really excited he's with us today. So, Charlie, I'm really very interested in your career path, which seems to have been an interesting one. It was actually a bit more of a drunkard's walk, semi-random. I've been for a variety of careers. Um, I actually qualified and worked as a pharmacist for a while, then switched track, degree in computer science, worked as a technical author, and then programmer in a startup or two. But really, the initial impetus was famously bad careers advice when I was about 15. Because in the English education system, you have to specialize and focus at, in my view, a very, very premature age on the subjects you'll study for your A-level exams, aged 18, which dictate what you can do by way of university degrees. And I had to make the choice on what to specialize in. In 1979 to 1980, when I was about 15, at a point where unemployment tripled overnight and the economy crashed 10% in the United Kingdom with the closure of the coal mines and the steel industries and an awful lot of stuff that had been kept on life support by successive governments. So the careers advice was, I knew I wanted to be a writer at this point, but you can't really get a day job as a novelist. You can't really do a degree and get a job as a novelist. Get yourself a profession, something that will be safe and earn you a decent living. And who look, pharmacy. There is zero unemployment among pharmacists. I wonder why you can't study pharmacy. You've got decent background in biology and chemistry and physics. So uh, 
I went into pharmacy for a bit, and that's seven years of my life I'm not going to get back. So I'm super curious, like, how did you decide? I mean, it sounds like you had the inspiration or uh, like something called you to writing early, like or to science fiction or speculative fiction or wh- whatever we want to call it. But like, how did you get interested in computers that early? Because that was an unusual thing at the time, right? Uh, actually, no. Um, around 1980, you had the big boom in 8-bit computing that hit the UK. And I think things happened a bit differently in the UK from the United States. We had this range of very, very cheap and cheerful, not games consoles the way the Japanese had them, and not serious, useful computers like the Apple II or the K-Pro of CPM stuff that was happening in the United States, but stuff like the Sinclair Spectrum and the BBC Model B that was designed specifically for education. And... um, This stuff was everywhere around the time I was turning 15, 16. Unfortunately, my school only got a computer lab when I was 17, which was too late for me to take A-levels in it and go straight into computer science. So really, I sort of got detoured away from what I would have been a natural for, simply because it wasn't an available career path, because I was just a couple of years too early. Interesting. How, How did you first get interested in writing? Okay, now we have to rewind a bit. When I was about five, my mother was trying to write a novel, bashing it out on a manual typewriter on the kitchen table. And like most people who try to write a novel, she never got more than one chapter in. She kept rewriting that first chapter. But somehow, when you're a five-year-old at home in the summer holidays, it sort of normalizes this as an adult activity rather than something strange and surreal. And uh, highlights, I did pretty well in English at school. In fact, I was sort of rated a severe loss to the English department when I headed for STEM instead. (laughs) Um, One particular exercise when I was about 12, we had a teacher who wanted everybody in the class to try and write a short story. When I say a short story, I mean fill an entire workbook rather than just the odd page. I learned to use a typewriter around the age of 12, and um, that was about the time I was getting into Dungeons & Dragons, which was also a new thing back then. And it was just sort of a collision between interests and skills that ended up going sideways on me. Um, I was trying to write from a very early age. I think my, I, I wrote my first novel-shaped object when I was about 15. Wow. Um, don't ask for it. If I find it, I will burn it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm just always fascinated by this. Like, write, writing a novel at any age is a real serious undertaking in, uh, in, in sort of focus and commitment, and I'm doing it well. It just requires, I think, some amalgamation of talents that most people may not have. Where do you think that came from at 15? I'm not really sure. Um, I mean, actually, now you put it that way, it is kind of freaky. I was also <laughs> trying to write short stories as well, because... The feedback loop for a short story is much, much tighter than for a novel. Indeed, my first professionally published stuff began showing up shortly after I turned 20. Um, It was another decade before I was anywhere close to selling a novel, because you've really got to get a degree in the University of Life before you've got enough to say about the human condition to write a book other people will want to read. So, how to put it? Yeah, I focused on short fiction for a while in my early 20s, kept trying to figure out how to make a novel work. I didn't read books on how to write. I didn't take an MFA in creative writing. I just sort of taught myself, and I was a slow learner. Um, There were also a number of, again, I said my career was a drunkard's walk earlier. There were a number of side quests that led me down blind alleys and distracted me for a while. Um, If there's one career that is, in my view, pretty incompatible with being a novelist, it's being a technical author. And I spent mm-hmm. a few years as a technical author working on the documentation team for SCO Unix, back when SCO was an actual Unix OEM. And that sort of killed my productivity for a few years. And then around 1993, the tech pubs team discovered the World Wide Web at HTML, I mean, pretty early on. It was the answer to their dream, which was one set of source code for all the publications. I mean, we've seen where that's gone since. And... I ended up talking to a whole bunch of people outside the company and ended up with a job in a startup, uh, which went the way of all startups, and then another, and then another. And the startup death march is is not really compatible with being a novelist either. What they were compatible with, again, a side quest, 
uh, was uh, writing articles for computer magazines. Now, you're familiar with the American magazine Computer Shopper. Mm -hmm. There's a British publisher, guy who guy who called Felix Dennis, who died a few years ago. Um, he set up Dennis Publishing, which is now a fairly major trade press publisher in London. And on a business trip to the United States in the mid-80s, he took a look at Computer Shopper and thought, this is great, and he ripped it off. He ripped off the title, the format, the structure, the whole lot. And he bought it back to the United Kingdom and set up a British magazine called Computer Shopper, which for many years was the second, number two best-selling monthly computer newsstand magazine. And he handed editorial over to a succession of impressively eccentric British computer journalists from the early 1980s microcomputer boom and got them to commission editorial content on whatever the hell interested them by people who were interested in the subject, not journalism graduates, but uh, computer geeks, which is why I ended up writing the Linux column there for five years. Were you a, were you a fan of uh, Jerry Pornell? Uh, um, he was a fun guy to have a pint of beer with. I will say he was also a terrible troll on various internet discussion for I knew him through. And... Um, I don't see eye to eye with him on didn't see eye to eye with him on politics, not in the slightest. But hey, that's uh, I, I read his column continuously in Byte for several years. Yeah, yeah, and and that's the reason I ask. Uh, you know, it's it's there do seem to be some interesting coincidences here. You know, you uh, you've got Ted Chang, who is uh, like an excellent science fiction author, who was uh, a tech writer for a while. You've got uh, you know Jerry Pornell, who despite his politics uh wrote some very interesting science fiction books and had this column in, in bite magazine that at least uh to kids like me was influential bite was very influential yeah yeah there was a lot of overlap i think partly it's small world syndrome back in 1993 the internet at least consumer internet was pretty much not a thing i mean i had it through work working for a multinational doing unit stuff but most people had never even heard of it and an early internet startup called Demon Internet, they were the first actual dial-in ISP startup in London. I was one of their first 2,000 customers. And about 12 months in, in early 1994, they organized a series of pub meetups. And a friend of mine turned around about 10 years ago and said, hey, Charlie, do you know anyone who was at that pub meet who didn't end up in the industry? And, you know, I thought for a bit and I said, um, hang on, my wife, hang on, didn't she do some consulting for AOL? Yeah, busted. <laughs> it was a small world. Well, it, it sort of felt at the time much smaller than it does right now. I mean, sometimes uh, I think it's a little hard these days to get your bearings on not just the world of tech, but what is happening on the Internet, because in some sense, it's sort of merged with life in this grand way, which it hadn't at the time. It was sort of this apparatus sitting on the on the side of things. Absolutely. One of the craziest things I've noticed is Moore's law. The well, we're nearing the end of Moore's law as a phenomenon governing integrated circuit density. But for its duration, we saw something similar happening with the number of people who are connected and also the number of people involved in computing. I mean, nowadays, when Apple launches a new generation of iPhone, you can look at it and say, right, that's 50 million more sales within how many months? Back in 1994, there weren't 50 million computers in the whole world, you know, probably less than 5 million. Each time we've seen a generational improvement in uh, microprocessor performance, the number of people using them seems to have doubled. Yeah, I was uh, I, I was watching um, an interview with Brian Kernahan, who I got the chance to work with very briefly uh, when I was mm-hmm. at Google in New York. Um, he, he did an interview with this uh, guy Lex Friedman, who does these very interesting uh, interviews with tech people. Brian was talking about his early work with the PDP eight, and I just did a quick web search and and looked up the Wikipedia entry for this particular machine and they sold 200 of them, uh, which is just crazy when you think about 
what constitutes a good volume for computer sales or mobile phone sales or whatever these days. Absolutely. I mean, it was a tiny world. I wanted to shift a a little bit into talking about how it is that you get inspiration for writing, because superficially, I, I would think that part of my job and part of your job are alike. We we both, in a sense, have to be able to imagine what the future is going to look like. And then we have to be able to describe that future well enough to a group of people that they understand what we're saying. In your case, I, I, I think you're trying to inform and entertain and provoke folks, although I would love to love to hear, you know, like, you know, what, what exactly it is your mission is uh, other than earning, uh, earning a living from writing science fiction. Mine is like, I have to sort of imagine the future and then persuade enough people to go do work to make part of what that description of the future is reality. How do you start this process of trying to imagine what the future might be like uh, so that you can have a foundation for the stories that you're telling? Okay. Um, I don't always start from a point from the perspective of the world building itself i usually start from a point of view of the characters because fiction is essentially the study of a human condition under circumstances that don't currently apply and you know if you're going to talk about the human condition you have to start by talking about people having said that there are a couple of books i wrote in 2006 and 2009 which were very tightly focused on the world 10 years in the future. It was going to be a trilogy, but unfortunately the third book in the trilogy has been persistently derailed by political developments in the real world. Um, I mean, I just can't write it. I've had about two or three different plots for it, both destroyed. The most recent one, it was killed by COVID-19 because I do not want to write a book about a viral pandemic at this point. Yeah. Um, (laughs) Anyway, those books were Halting State and Rule 34, And the idea of Halting State, I got in 2005 when I was at a science fiction convention, at a panel discussion, discussing uh, massively multiplayer online role-playing games like World of Warcraft at that point. And a member of a panel who were on the top table at that point came up with a couple of points. The first was that MMOs were the first commercially successful virtual reality environment one in which you have lots of people with avatars meeting each other. Um, Forget the lack of headsets or tactile feedback or head positioning and so on. There's still a window into a virtual world. The second thing he came up with was there's economics involved. He gave, as an example, an anecdote of an incident that happened in London a couple of years earlier when a guy walked into a police station to report a crime. Somebody he'd met on the internet had sold him a magic sword, and it wasn't magic. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> it turned out to be fraud. It, you know, he'd, be, he'd bought a uh, weapon inside a game via an eBay auction, and it wasn't as described. It did actually get written up as a fraud. And I suddenly realized at this point, hang on, I need to do some digging here. And I did some digging and discovered some exotic studies, including one paper that confirmed if you take in-game currencies and convert them to real-world currencies using whatever players are running as an exchange rate, by about 1999, there was one game which had an economy with about the same value as the GDP of Austria. But, well, no, you can't really do a real-world conversion like that because it's just fatuous. You'd you'd crash the in-game economy if you tried anyway. Mm -hmm. But uh, there was something going on here. And, you know, Economics is the study of how human beings allocate resources under conditions of scarcity. And I began to ask myself, what's the world going to look like in 10 years' time if we really do get artificial augmented reality goggles and self-driving cars and computer games everywhere and MMOs and uh, live-action role-playing combined with high-bandwidth always-on stuff? So I started designing what I thought the world of 2017 would look like. And... I got this book written and had a bit of a hard time selling it in the UK, although it sold well enough in the US. The problem is a crime novel set in 2017 in an independent Scotland where it opens with a cop being summoned to the boardroom of a startup company she doesn't understand in a former 
converted nuclear bunker. To be told there'd been a bank robbery, a gang of orcs with a dragon for fire support had robbed the central bank inside an MMO. (laughs) And she gradually, well, various consultants are called in, including forensic accountants and a computer guy, because you need a computer guy for this sort of stuff, and so on. And we gradually discover that somebody has come up with a exploit for compromising the private keys of a company whose basic speciality is arbitrage between the economics of competing MMOs, because one games company after another is trying to poach their competitors' customers. And there's now a capture of a flag game in progress between rival teams of Chinese hackers who are trying to hijack the economy of a small European state. (laughs) Now, to get to where where this was going to go, I tried to do some rigorous extrapolation and came up with a couple of rules of thumb. And the first is, if you're looking 10 years in the future, 70% of that world is here today. About half the cars on the street, they're already there. You know, they're going to be there in 10 years' time. They're still going to be driving. They're going to be a bit more decrepit, but they're out there. Buildings? The average house in the UK is 75 years old. I know American dwellings tend to be a lot younger, but, you know, 10 years' time, there's not going to be much turnover. There'll be a few new office buildings, a few new developments, but most of what we see is there. The people, everybody's going to be 10 years older. The people at the top of the age range will, well, they won't be visible anymore. The kids, they're going to be teenagers, but it's the same stuff. 70% of it is there today. You then get another 20%. No, actually, it's about 80% that's there today. You then get about another 15% that is pretty much predictable. It's on roadmaps. We knew back in 2006, 2007, that by 2017, we'd be looking at, we'd have 3G cellular telephony as standard, and something called 4G would almost certainly be out there, but not universal by then you know i had no idea what the 4g standards were but 3g was 3g was pretty much visible everything back then was running on gsm the state of the phones we were using again it was fairly obvious that they would be connected devices and they'd be very smart pocket computers i missed a call on that by going for artificial reality goggles shades of google glass which as we know kind of crashed in the market for social reasons rather than technological feasibility. It may eventually happen. There's always, though, an element of a couple of percent, which is who ordered that? You know, stuff that comes out of left field completely and is completely unpredicted. The CCD image sensor that we have in all our cameras today was, I think, developed in the 1980s, actually commercialized, and people realized that these things were literally cheap as chips. What are we going to do with them? Where are we going to put them? The idea that everybody would be carrying a decent quality camera around with them at all times, though, a video camera that could upload to the internet, uh, that was not something most people were prepared to grapple with. And the idea that there'd be a craze for happy slapping, whereby teenagers would find a random stranger and video one of their mates going up to them and beating the crap out of them, and then put it on YouTube... Yeah, luckily that was a short-lived craze. Most of the people who did it didn't realise they were basically preparing evidence for prosecution. (laughs) But uh, it's a second-order consequence. As Frederick Pohl once said, anyone can predict the automobile. The difficult bit is predicting the traffic jam. Mm -hmm. In some sense, like I think the scenario that you just described, uh, if I were to give this book to my 12-year-old daughter who has never known a world without tablets, without Minecraft, without, you know, massive multiplayer online environments, uh, virtual worlds, she would sort of look at that and say, like, this is plausibly nonfiction. Like, she could believe everything about it. Uh, It doesn't require a leap of faith on her part, which is, you know, like a huge amount of credibility to your ability to imagine near future, which is hard. Yeah, but there's other stuff I got wrong in it. Um, One of the plot points relies on not self-driving cars, but it occurred to me that if, you know, everybody would want self-driving cars, but the AI issues looked pretty difficult, especially in 2005, 2006. So instead, high quality of service 4G networks and call centers with drivers in them driving the Mm -hmm. cars remotely. I believe this is actually a startup business model that's being attempted. Yep. And you'd have, well, remote drive taxis. 
which of course leads to the entertaining scenario of somebody's taxi is hijacked and driven at a bridge abutment. <laughs> um, yes. But, you know, we did not get to self-driving cars by that point. Again, the Google Glass type stuff, I imagined something called cop space that the police would be using, which would basically combine a geographical information system with the contents of all the police intelligence databases so that an officer walking around the streets could actually look at a building and see what crimes or acts of vandalism or incidents had been reported in conjunction with it. And that's something that, well, we haven't got that. Instead, we've got armoured personnel carriers and machine guns being handed out to cops. Personally, I think I'd rather they had the uh, AR goggles. Yeah. Seriously. So, I mean, you, you mentioned a minute ago about uh, thinking sort of seriously about scarcity in these digital environments. Do you do you think if we could abolish scarcity that we get to a Star Trek like world or is, is scarcity a useful constraint for organizing human behavior? OK, firstly, I don't think we can ever abolish scarcity because humans are very ingenious at creating scarcity because they're obsessed with status. We are basically primates, and far too many of us want to know that we are valuable or important, and attention is the ultimate thing that's in short supply. We have a limited number of hours in a week in which to worship our superiors. <laughs> now, material scarcity, we're already at the point, we passed a point decades ago, as Keynes pointed out, where... We don't need to have everybody working in the fields doing backbreaking labor for food. We don't need them in the factories doing similar for material goods. Much of what we do today, as per the sociologist David Graeber's work, is actually bullshit jobs, administrative stuff, stuff that should be automated, but we've got ourselves into this social hierarchy whereby you can't eat if you don't earn money with which to pay for stuff. Um, we have a rationing system that's contingent on us doing work, even if the work is pointless for any reason other than shoring up the status of somebody higher up the pole. I don't have a prescription for how to get out of here. In fact, the past five or six years have sent me screaming in the direction of writing fantasy. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with my laundry files stories, but... I am. Okay. I'm currently nearly finishing what is going to be sold as book 11 in the series. It's not really. It's actually book two of a new series because I can't finish a series about political, a political singularity, you know, ruled by elder gods in the current political climate. So I'm taking a side quest into what the cops and robbers are doing in the world of the new management with Deadlines Dreaming that comes out this October and the sequel. The, and the title of this book is uh, Deadlines Dreaming? Correct. It comes out on October the 27th. Awesome. It's basically what civilians are doing under the world of a new management, the motto of which is strong and stable government. And it doesn't get much stronger or more stable than Nialat Hotep, the Black Pharaoh. And this was meant to be a horrible, monstrous nightmare scenario when I began writing it around 2016, this sequence. Only it's now kind of utopian, competent government. <laughs> <laughs> it may be evil, but it knows what it's doing. I, I have wondered, reading your blog post uh, about this process, how it is that you maintain your sanity. Because it's like the, 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 you're, you're a human being living through all of this political turmoil and disruption, which sort of has its normal set of impacts, and it's tampering with your professional life. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I'm just trying to front run the insanity in my fiction, and I'm having great difficulty making Elder Gods more horrifying than what's happening around the world today. Um, I will add, there was a novel I began work on in 2016 and shelved in 2017 that I want to get back to probably next year. I shelved it when my father was terminally ill, and I just couldn't continue to focus on it. But it's a space opera, and I self-consciously began it in the wake of the Brexit business and Mr. Trump's election, on the grounds that there was absolutely no way anything currently happening could mess up a book set two-thirds of a million years in the future. You know, that's another strategy for getting away from it. Yeah. And what I wanted to do with that was to examine an interstellar polity where humanity has radiated and speciated. Our kind are extinct. We are remembered as the last common hominid 
ancestor species, much the same way we look back on Australopithecines or Neanderthals. Also, science is a completed enterprise. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Two-thirds of a million years of research, information retention from all that time, pretty much anything that can be discovered in mathematics will have been discovered by then, if it can be discovered by human-grade intelligences. This assumes no access to truly superhuman intelligences, um, at least none that we can create. Physics, chemistry, biology are pretty much mined out. What we're left with is stamp collecting and librarianship. If you want to know something about the way the universe works, you look for librarian. Interesting. At that remove in time, a device like a dragon capsule is of similar antiquity to a flint hand axe from the Neolithic. That's, that's such a cool idea. So these are like super different things to write about near future versus far. Um, like, is there anything structurally different about how you go about your writing process? I mean, like it, it, so it sounds like it always starts with character. Is it easier to think about the far future when you're sort of unconstrained by like having to have leaps or paths that are more plausible to the, the future that you're describing than, than near future? I've discovered over years that every book, I basically have to reinvent how to write a book. And for writing far future material or fantasy, you can't write without constraints. You've got to have a framework within which to write. So if anything, you've got to do more work. Writing something set in a parallel version of our current world or in a version of our current world with magic or in the very near future is actually easier in some ways because, as I said earlier, you know what's out there. You know what it's going to be like. Most of it is already there. Um, the far future, in contrast, you've got to invent just about everything. So the first of your books that I read was uh, Singularity Sky, uh, and you wrote a, a whole series of books uh, around that time. So Singularity Sky, there was Halting State, there was Accelerando, which was uh, a collection of short stories, uh, if I'm remembering correctly. Yeah. I mean, the, these were, I mean, at, at a certain point, like I, it was you and Peter Hamilton and Alastair Reynolds and Ian Banks. And I thought, uh, like it was all I read and I thought all science fiction, uh, authors must, uh, come from the United Kingdom. Uh, and, but they were super influential. Um, and, and it was sort of centered around these, this notion of, a singularity and artificial intelligence and have you ever thought about revisiting uh those things or, or do you think you know you've said everything that is uh interesting to be said about those uh those topics or worlds i will sort of be revisiting it in the space opera i mentioned ghost engine when i get around to rewriting it i mean don't look for it in print before 2023 at the earliest i've got a huge backlog of stuff However, I'll be revisiting it from a somewhat sceptical point of view. The last decade in deep learning and artificial intelligence has taught us that artificial intelligence is not what anybody back then really expected to find, and that there are some interesting constraints on it. The singularity as an idea, it has an interesting ancestry, and uh, the person who's done most to give me a guideline to it is Ken McLeod, Scottish SF writer, who you may have heard of, another of the, mm -hmm. the same category. And Ken makes some interesting points about the singularity. Ken's background is he's the son of a lay preacher from the Highlands and Islands, so had a sort of odd Christian fundamentalist upbringing, got over it, went to university, and contracted Trotskyism. So since when <laughs> he's been healthily sceptical of every ideology that promises jam tomorrow. And um, the point he made was the singularity itself never mind when is it going to happen or is it possible or how do we build an AI, has some very disturbing features in common with Christianity. And he traced the origins of singularitarian thinking back to a Russian Orthodox theologian in the 19th century, Nikolai Fedorovich Fedorov, who, among other things, taught the young Konstantin Tsiolkovsky, who invented the rocket equation, um, generally known as the father of rocketry. Fedorov was his theology was a bit weird, even by Russian Orthodox standards. His view was, sorry, he took a teleological view of human existence. His view was humans are meant to converge with God and bring about the kingdom of God. 
And to this end, this means human nature must be perfectible. So what does it take to perfect human nature? Well, we have to become immortal for starters. We have to leave the Earth and colonize the entire universe. So um, photosynthesis is part of a package along with interstellar flight. Mm -hmm. But it's an insult to everybody alive who reaches this state of perfect grace if their ancestors remain mouldering in the grave. So we must also seek to bring about the resurrection through technological means. And it's obvious that this is God's plan. Is this sounding like the singularity to you? It should be. Because, <laughs> well, Tsiolkovsky and other Russians took Fedorov's Russian Orthodox, not exactly a heresy, but variant theology, and turned it into an ideology called cosmism in the 1920s and 1930s, before, along with virtually everything else interesting happening in the early Soviet Union, it was flattened by Stalin. And a bunch of this stuff ended up in California, both via people like the Jet Propulsion Lab, Jack Parsons was one particular nexus, and let's not get into the connection with uh, the Scientologist and L. Ron Hubbard here, uh, but rocketry transhumanism it cross fertilized with the libertarians as well and ayn rand is possibly a vector for that uh you get this into the early computer pioneers and then you come up with a, the singularity being expressed in fiction by verna vinge who it's no coincidence is a retired computer science professor now the problem here is when you start talking about simulation hypothesis and up, mind uploading and the rest of it you're getting very, very close to talking about Christian eschatology. And this reached its peak about a decade ago with speculation about Rocco's Basilisk, a hypothesized descendant AI vastly far in the future who will resurrect us all and torture us for eternity for the sin of not having contributed to its existence. I mean, this is Satan. This is self-professed atheist singularitarians reinvent original sin and Satan. I'm sorry, and I don't buy it, because, you know, I am not a believer, but I'm of Jewish upbringing, and I don't buy Christian eschatology at all. I'm sorry. It, it, it's sort of interesting what, what must go on inside of a bi biological brain to produce these, uh, these patterns over and over again. Because it, it I, I, as you describe it, it does seem absolutely plausible that that the singularity like has these theological overtones, and I, I'm not I'm not entirely sure. I mean, like I, I know a whole bunch of people who think about the singularity. Like I don't think they think of it in those uh, terms. Like they probably haven't seen the connection. I think of it as being a bit like design patterns in programming. Christianity is a very, very successful syncretistic design pattern for religion. It has tap roots in a bunch of religions that were circulating around that part of the Middle East around um, the beginning of the Common Era, not just Jewish Essene cults and Pharisaic thought, um, but also there's a chunk of the Isis cult, the whole resurrection of Osiris, uh, the Egyptian god, there are chunks of Manichaean dualism, Zoroastrianism, in the sense of an evil god, because Satan in Christianity has massively ramped up powers compared to fairly feeble prosecution adversary in traditional Jewish thought. It then acquired a whole bunch of Mithraism from the Romans, and it basically didn't embrace and, ex and extend on the entire Roman pantheon. There are so many Roman and pagan gods who got turned into saints, but it makes your head spin. So it's a design pattern, and it shouldn't be that surprising that people who were raised in Christian families or who had Christian parents and lived in a broadly Christian culture, the United States and Europe for that matter, um, even if they rejected the belief system explicitly, would be vulnerable to another syncretistic tech-based explanatory hypothesis that followed the same pattern. What the MacGuffin I'm using in uh, Ghost Engine is that, no, we can't actually build a vastly transcendent AI, although we get stuff that's almost good enough for government purposes. But um, everyone and their dog goes in for settling planets and 
genetic engineering. And one of the common patterns is nasty people set themselves up as a master race with servants. The master race tend to go extinct before the servants are doing all the hard work, keeping them going. And the best way to keep the servants down is to program them for religiosity. Upshot, you get an awful lot of holy wars breaking out over who gets to run the upload afterlife that nobody's yet built. Oh, interesting. I forget which of uh, Ian Banks' novels, um, maybe it was Hydrogen Sonata, uh, where there were these particular species that had uh, had hell as part of their uh, religious belief system. And, and like th- they, they had gotten to the technological sophistication where they could create a uh, like a, a technological virtual afterlife uh, so that they could send people to hell. And like it had gotten to the crass point that they had outsourced the operations of their virtual hells to other people. <laughs> Oh, yeah. So we end up with a situation where there's an entrepreneur who's been buying up hells from various <laughs> civilizations to keep them running at a profit. Yeah, it's uh, very twisted. Yeah, it's it's very twisted. So um, I I know from reading, uh, reading some of the stuff that you've been writing on your blog that uh, you may not be in uh, the most optimistic mood about the future of uh, the human race right now. But like, is there anything interesting technologically that you sort of see on the horizon or, or like not even technologically, just sort of any good that you think that can come out of the current moment that we're in? One thing that's very clearly happening is we're seeing the end of the carbon bubble that's dominated Western economies for about 120 years. It's happening far faster and far harder than anyone imagined. And part of it is the price of photovoltaic cells crashing ridiculously. Nobody was really expecting this. And I think it's going to have huge political impacts on the Middle East and elsewhere in the near future. But in the long term, it's necessary because the biggest problem facing us is an unmanageable climate. In particular, we're only a couple of degrees of warming away from agriculture being destabilized. And without agriculture, we're not eating. That's pretty terrible. That's worse than any of the other effects. But we seem to be pivoting away from fossil fuels with remarkable speed. I hesitate to mention the name Elon Musk. He reputedly turned around in 2000 and came to the conclusion we needed to get off fossil fuels. We needed electric cars because cars are out there. And he had the right idea, which is build a supercar and give it some kind of charisma because all previous electric car projects were just dismal. And we're now at a point where everybody is pivoting towards electric vehicles. And credit for doing that pivot, even if Tesla goes bust tomorrow, I don't think they will at this point. He's engineered a transition. Um, The second thing, and, you know, again, this is a name that keeps coming up. Uh, SpaceX is, I don't think much of a prospect of actually colonizing Mars. I think it's a really idiotic thing to do. I mean, the Gobi Desert is a whole lot closer, a whole lot more hospitable than Mars will be even after a thousand years of terraforming. And if it goes wrong, you can get home from there. Um, Excuse me, a one-way trip to Mars, which means you're going to be living in something the size of an RV for the rest of your life, doesn't sound that appealing or practical. But he's building out infrastructure. It's like railroad time in the 1840s in England when the railways got built. An awful lot of people went bust. An awful lot of railway projects didn't get used for the purpose for which they were planned. But they left the UK with the infrastructure it needed for the Industrial Revolution to continue. I don't know quite what's going to come out of SpaceX, but it is going to disrupt a whole lot of fields. I think Starlink is the most likely thing in the short term. I would be very unsurprised to see him beating NASA to the moon with a manned mission in the next few years at this rate. I'm a bit less happy about the fact that there are far too many assholes out there who are not building things, but who are just trying to grab as much money as they can rather than doing something that generates money as a side effect. And that seems to be the besetting problem with the era we've moved into. It's too much of a focus on getting rich and not enough of a focus on why we should be doing this. Yeah, I I very strongly agree that um, like we, we need to figure out some way or another how to align 
people's incentives around, you know, accumulation of status or wealth or whatever it is that motivates people and doing more good for the world. And like, I don't say that in this Pollyanna Silicon Valley uh, way. Uh, like I know there are a lot of people who have deceived themselves into thinking that they're doing good and, and aren't, but like we, we do need, I think to get the incentives genuinely, uh, genuinely aligned better than they are right now. Yeah. We currently have an incentive system that rewards sociopaths with status and that's toxic in the long run. I've just written a book recently, uh, not, not fiction, non, nonfiction about, uh, AI and the future of work. And, you know, one of the provocations that I had in, in my book is to challenge people to think about the ways in which technology can turn zero sum games into non zero sum ones. I mean, it, it more or less, uh, for like the big challenging problems that we have, technology is the only thing that can perform that magic trick. It, it's the thing that allows us to, relax constraints and and create abundance from uh, abundance from scarcity and thinking very carefully about where it is we can apply that trick to you know maximum global benefit i think is is interesting like you, you mentioned one that i i care a lot about which is uh, climate and sustainability um but there are a bunch of others as well like feeding you know world that's headed towards peak population, uh, you know, figuring out how to deal with uh, water scarcity, you know, figuring out like simple things like healthcare. Uh, like I say, they sim- they're simple, but they're, they're not. Um, but, you know, that, that's one of those silly zero sum games that we're in right now where you're, you, you have, you have a population of human beings who want to be in excellent health, uh, rightly so. And, uh, at least in the United States, which I, I've, <laughs> uh, this is an interesting uh, discussion to have with a, you know, with a British person. Uh, like our cost of delivering high quality healthcare in the United States is growing faster than our gross domestic product. And, you know, one of the ways that you can potentially tackle a problem like that is like have a technological uh, intervention that says, here's a way to bend the shape of that cost curve down uh, where, Instead of under escalating costs, you're figuring out like who gets access to the healthcare and how much, uh, which is a very contentious conversation. If you can change the cost dynamics of the thing through technology, maybe uh, the conversation is less contentious and you can figure out how to give everybody access to the thing. Yeah, but I'm afraid the real underlying problem in healthcare in the United States especially, but also in the UK and elsewhere, is a regulatory framework one. We have a problem with regulatory capture. We have a problem with drug development. We have a problem with commercialization of new medicines. Our development of new antibiotics has crashed to almost nil, just as antibiotic resistance has become almost universal. And this is killing tens of thousands of people a year in the UK alone. It's catastrophic. Uh, We went for a period from about 19... About 1939 to 1970, 1975, in medicine, we were innovating and developing new categories of pharmaceutical and new treatments, and also understanding a lot of the uh, underlying phenomena of uh, human biology at a ridiculous rate. And then it sort of hit a brick wall. We've seen similar brick walls before in other areas. For example, aerospace technology had its own version of Moore's Law with transportation speed doubling, which, again, hit a brick wall in 1970 due to energy issues. Um, I think in biology, the real problem is co- is complexity. And we're going to be seeing great gains from AI and deep learning in the next decade or two. But we have a regulatory environment that makes it difficult to bring new treatments to the public at an affordable price for whatever reason. And um, I'm not sure we can solve that just through technology. It's going to actually need political will to do it and uh, redesign of the patent system for one thing. Yeah, I I do not disagree with that at all. Uh, The the thing that I've been trying to do is I talk with some of the people who are making some of this policy uh, is that 
maybe their job as policymakers gets a little bit easier if they can figure out how to reframe this thing as like dividing up a fixed size pie versus, uh, you know, making some investments in things that can create increase the size of the pie for uh, for everyone. Um, Because I think part part of the issue that we have with our politics in general, I think this is sort of a global uh, a global problem is that that issue of contention where like most of the dialogue is about I have the thing that I care about and I want to get the resources directed towards that. And you have the thing that uh, you care about and you want the resources directed to that and those two things. Uh, under zero-sum constraints are in conflict with one another. You nailed it with zero-sum constraints. Part of a problem is fundamentally an education issue in that too many people are being are growing up ignorant of how iterated game theory scenarios work and of the fact that it's even possible to have an interaction with a rival where you both benefit. And this is part of the reason I'm so pessimistic. I mean, we're both in our 50s we're old enough to have seen this stuff before yeah although i uh you know i i've I've been saying to people uh for the past few years that i am uh i'm short-term pessimistic long-term optimistic and i think part of that's why why i became an engineer like i i ever since i was a little kid i look at the world and and see everything that's broken uh I think that's a necessary trait for uh, for an engineer. But like you do have to have a little bit of long term optimism, uh, like faith that you can go fix things. Uh, otherwise, you you can get yourself into a very uh, a very deep state of deadlock. <laughs> you know, the difference between a pessimist and an optimist, the pessimist, the glass is half empty, the optimist, the glass is half full, the engineer, the glass is twice the size it needs to be. And the visionary, okay, we need to figure out how to fill this bigger glass. <laughs> Indeed. That's awesome. So I, I uh, before we go, I wanted to, I, I always ask everyone uh, what it is that they do for fun outside of their professional life. Um, so what, what you do sounds incredibly fun uh, and romantic, this whole idea of being a, being a science fiction writer. Um so I, I imagine your job is lots of fun. Uh. <laughs> the job is frustrating. It's lots of fun when it's going well and I'm actually making progress. It does tend to require a background that's relatively stable. And the past few years have been a complete flaming dumpster fire. Um, COVID-19 is the icing on the cake. I mean, on my to-do list are the final editing tweaks on a book, Invisible Sun, that was originally due out in 2016. It got delayed because my editor died when a bookcase fell on him. Then I was working on it again, and my dad died. Then I was working on it again, and my mother died. And I just handed in the final draft, and COVID-19 happened. <laughs> I mean, it's cursed. Uh, yeah, well, oh, that, that, that really does sound stranger than fiction, uh, what you just described. <laughs> yeah, I'm just keeping my eyes open for a dinosaur-killing asteroid now. <laughs> So, uh, so I am curious. Do you uh, do you have things that you do outside of uh, your writing routine for for fun? Right now, my social life and my leisure activities have been stomped on by basically isolation. Um, I have metabolic syndrome, hypertension, and type two diabetes, and as a result, if I get COVID nineteen, I'm at much higher risk than J random other person of my age. So I'm reducing my exposure. And even though the pubs have reopened, you're not going to catch me going there. Yeah. And, you know, it's really kind of upsetting. <laughs> um, I don't think I've seen any friends in person for about three months now, face to face. You know, Zoom chats are one thing, but a Zoom chat is not the same thing, yes. frankly. It is not. And you, uh, you used to... I mean, part of your job, I don't know how much of it you enjoyed, was going to science fiction uh, conventions and uh, these big events where there were huge numbers of people and uh, unclear when any of those will be coming back. Uh, did you enjoy those things? Oh, hell yes. Um, unfortunately, while a lot of them are taking place online for the panels and the symposia, after 30 years of going, I'm more there for people than the panels. Yeah. You know, I was kind of burnt out on sitting on a panel discussion. So, you know, that's it's knocked a, a much bigger hole in my social life than I actually realized. Yeah. Interesting. Well, I, I I am hopeful. I'm, I'm spending an enormous amount of my time trying to help 
companies that are developing therape- therapeutics and vaccines for uh, COVID-19. And I have had on again, off again involvement in uh, the biosciences for the past 25 years. And I can say I've never seen things move quite this fast. So I, I have some degree of optimism that we're going to have a, a set of remedies coming out for uh, for COVID-19 that will make it less a miserable thing and that some of these uh, things that you and a great many other people enjoy uh, can resume in the not too distant future. Yeah, I hope you're right about that. And, you know, I think if we get through the next century, well, I don't mean us personally because we're not going to be around, but if humanity survives the next century, we're going to be in pretty good shape because there is going to be huge climate change, but we will have survived the first onset of it and the worst of it. As you mentioned, we're hitting peak population probably around 2060, 2070, and then declining, which is part of what's stressing the climate. Um, We will have gotten off oil and petrochemicals by then. We will hopefully have fixed our current wave of social crises that are hitting globally at the same time. You know, I did not want to spend my 50s rerunning the 1930s experience, but the 1930s were eventually followed by the 1950s and 1960s. Yeah, yeah, I, I think they're, you know, it, it, not to take anything away from the gravity of the moment that we're in, I think uh, I think there are a bunch of reasons to be hopeful about the the future. I mean, another thing that I don't know whether you're tracking is uh, I, I've I've seen a just an enormous amount of progress on not just cancer detection, but uh, like very targeted cancer therapies. And there are a bunch of not insane people who think that cancer may be not defeated, but you know, just sort of a, a treatable illness uh, where uh, they're already like imagining what the what the research funding framework needs to look like when cancer is no longer the thing that you need to dump the most money into, uh, where it's probably going to become neurological disorders after that. Oh, yeah, we'll find something else that kills us. I mean, the one iron rule is we all die sooner or later. It's just we die of different things. Um, And as we get better at treating existing illnesses, new illnesses come to the fore with an associated mortality rate. Yeah, I mean... I think one thing we really do have to focus on is bacterial diseases, not just viral. Well, we're getting a crash course in virology and vaccine development right now and why it's important and why public health education is vital. The whole bacterial resistance thing has crept up on us. And I wish I was in a position to suggest to somebody that uh, maybe it's time to revisit the old Soviet phage therapies, basically viruses that are are lethal to pathogens, um, in conjunction with fast, cheap PCR sequences to sequence the bacterial genome mm-hmm. of the infections. Um, it used to be that if somebody wanted needed phage treatment for a fulminating bacterial illness, they had to culture it on agar if they could get it to grow at yep. all to identify it. Now we're not that constrained. If you add gene synthesizers to the mix, it's conceivable we could have a one-stop shop whereby you go in get a swab taken of the infection, sequence it to identify the pathogen, and have a phage synthesized on the spot to deal with it. That's a bit of a reach with current technology, but it's sort of not obviously impossible. I agree. It is not obviously impossible. Well, awesome. I I really uh, am so grateful that you took the time today to chat with us. And I am grateful for what you do in general. You have uh, brought me at least countless hours of enjoyment. And I am uh, very much looking forward to all of the books that you are uh, going to write in both the near and the far future. Uh, So thank you very much for what you do. Thanks for reading. I mean, a personal rule of thumb is if you're in a job where people will thank you for what you're doing and you're enjoying it, you've hit the jackpot. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well indeed I, I think you really have hit the jackpot uh, so thank thank you for thank you for being here today thanks so that was Kevin's conversation with Charlie Strauss wow what an amazing conversation what what was your kind of big takeaway from from that Kevin uh, my my big takeaway is Charlie is <laughs> 
super interesting. Uh, yeah. He he thinks very broadly about the world. Yeah, it, it's really interesting. Uh, you know, he, he like he, even at the end of the conversation, like he had this very pointed idea about what he thinks might be an interesting direction for research in the biosciences. Uh, and you know, earlier in the conversation, he was talking about. Trotskyism and eschatology, and uh, it, I mean, it's it's like just awesome to talk to someone who has such a broad ranging set of interests and and tries to integrate those into a uh, you know sort of a coherent theory of of humanity in the world. Yeah, no, I agree. From your perspective as an engineer, does his technical prowess? Do you think that's really kind of aided with both the stories that he tells and also the, I don't want to say predictions, but yeah, we'll say kind of predictions and and I guess commentary that he's making about our culture and about the role that technology plays in that? Yeah, I I think it's hard to imagine that it didn't influence him in in some ways. Uh, Like we talked about uh, a couple of other folks who had similar sorts of involvements in the computer industry. There's Jerry Mm -hmm. Pornell, there's... Ted Chang, there's uh, you know there's a bunch of people. Annalee Newitz and and Charlie Day, yeah, yeah, and and like you know, and there's also this collection of of folks. Uh, you know, Werner Vinge, uh, he mentioned was a computer scientist. Uh, you know, there are folks like Alastair Reynolds, uh, who was like another one of my favorite science fiction authors, who uh, was a physicist. Um, so like, there, there's just something uh something going on there and like the thing that i don't know and this would have been a good question to ask charlie is uh you know what is the chicken and what is the egg part of the thing that inspired me to become an engineer was reading these science fiction stories uh and i i just sort of wonder like how much of what they are doing and like the things that they have done in their career have been informed by which uh was it science fiction that turned him into an engineer or is it the engineer that turned him into a good science fiction uh writer and i i think you know the the answer to that question is it's complicated (laughs) yeah no i i think about that question a lot actually i was having this conversation with some friends recently where we were talking about the same thing and, and these were also engineers and it is interesting i think to kind of look at the way that the two have influenced one another because certainly there have been technological advancements that you could argue have been driven based on like science fiction and and things that have been written. But at the same time, a lot of what's written is also uh, driven by the actual science and the engineering research that's happening, which has been the case with, with Charlie's work. I think what Charlie does and what science fiction writers do in general is an extremely important thing for society above and beyond the, the entertainment that their work provides for people. I really, really believe this. I believe that we all are effectively the stories that we tell, like our, ability to function as a society is us believing in a vision for the future that is, uh, you know, sort of appealing and inspiring. And science fiction authors are some of the people that are telling part of that story about like painting a, a, a picture, or, like establishing a framework for what the future could look like. And whether they know it or not, or whether it's their intention, they are inspiring people who are then going to go out and push the future into that direction. And like, that's so critical. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I did a profile a number of years ago around some of the people who were involved in making the film Minority Report. And it's actually interesting because there was a lot of technical research that went alongside the visual effects and, you know, the storytelling aspect of that. And what happened actually because of some of the things that they were doing with Minority Report wound up becoming the multi-touch gestures that we all use today on devices, you know, and that that's just kind of a small example. Obviously, there are much broader and bigger things, too. And I think that's what's interesting about the stuff that Charlie writes is that we can inspire people to do those things and also think about the implications about what these stories mean. Yeah. And I like speaking of Minority Report, I think Philip K. Dick is uh, like one of the like, you know, he he may be the world champion of uh, (laughs) like writing so much stuff that has become so influential on people that they have created what he was imagining all those many years ago. 
No, uh, I mean, it, yeah, it, it's, it's so true. I mean, Blade Runner, uh, obviously, it's, it's different, but, you know, it's funny that we passed the point of when that was supposed to take place and the, the influence that that had on the preceding, you know, 30-odd years is really interesting. I, I also thought that Charlie's... Um this framework that he has for imagining the future where it's like, okay, 70 or 80% of the stuff is in the future is already here. Uh, And then you've got, you know, 10 or 15% of stuff that is going to happen. That is pretty, you know, straightforward to extrapolate. Uh, And then there's the weird stuff that really (laughs) change everything. And like the weird stuff is very, very hard to, to predict, you know? So when you find someone who can, call that 5% more accurately than others, you really do wonder like what's, what was going on with them. (laughs) Yeah. No, I mean, I think it just shows the power of creativity, whether it's in writing or engineering or, or anything else. Yeah. Super awesome. Fantastic. Fantastic conversation. All right. Well, that's it for our show today. And we appreciate that Charlie took some time away from his writing to chat with us. And we hope that you take a moment to write to us. So tell us who you'd like to have as a guest on the show, your favorite author, your most influential mentor, your most admired tech hero. We hope to hear from you at behind the tech at Microsoft.com. Take care out there. Yeah. And everyone should go out and buy uh, Charlie's book when it's published in October. We'll yes, buy his time. book, pre-order it. Yes. <laughs> See you next time. <laughs>